around us, Ray. This is not a drill. This is really happening, guys. Yeah. Oh, I was kidding. <laughs> that was a drill. <laughs> and now we are starting. Let's start with the same good natured laugh. <laughs> good natured. Joie de vie. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, welcome to Penn Sunday School. I'm Matt Donnelly. Michael Godot is on vacation, and we are broadcasting from Show Creator Studios South. This week, Penn met the winner of his master class. Also, coming up, we'll be talking about the merits of an artistic boycott, meeting Amazing Randy again, and uh, working on an age appropriate escape for the Penn and Teller Show. Plus, it's the 20 year anniversary of Tony called FedEx. Those words will mean something to you and me when Penn explains later on in the show. Here he is, preaching the love, Penn Gillette. It's a nice job. We did a good one, Preaching right? Preaching love here. Preaching love. Preaching love. love. Just got back from Memphis. Oh, I just got back from Phoenix. Phoenix. Yeah. Well, we're, we're doing a trucker song now. Look at we go. From Phoenix to Memphis. <laughs> How was Phoenix? It was uh, very lovely. Uh, we were there, and uh, as we try to get into this, you know, it was a little fundraiser that Piff was- Now, the, we is you and Piff. Yeah, Piff was the entertainer. I was I was a roadie, mm-hmm. tech tour manager. Um, no stage time for no you? stage time for me at this uh, gala event, which uh, if you were there, you'd be fine with. And um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's the last thing on a three-hour agenda, or a bunch of affluent people being plied with wine and 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 dinner. It was a uh, benefit uh, benefit for the Boys and Girls Club. Ah, uh, not the you know not the best environment to be getting people the wonders of magic, getting uh, tension in the room. Three hours in, yeah. Theatrical agreement, that kind of stuff. It's not not the strong suit there. No. He did fantastic. He's very funny. Um, but, uh, you know, Piff, and, uh, Piff being uncomfortable and sarcastic uh, in sarcastic retaliation kind of is his thing. So it works out fine for him in those environments. Anyways, but I was there and going in, uh, heightened police presence. Why? Well, we couldn't figure it out. Like, why is there like a bunch of police before we can get into this fundraiser for the Boys and Girls Club of America? Mm. Turns out there's two ballrooms at this hotel. Some other shindig happening in another ballroom. And finally, one of the security guys uh, uh, told me that uh, George W. Bush was next door. George as a W. guest of honor. And I go like, oh my gosh, if I get, talk, get caught talking to him. I know. Career <laughs> I is am <laughs> Man, I am dead. That was so amazing. You know, I mean... If you want to see yeah. uh, where we have to go, yes, Ellen is pointing us in that direction. I agree. And uh, yes, George W. Bush, not my favorite president. Right. Although my favorite president is not even on the list of my okay people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I'm trying to think, you know, I used to, I, I think I used to have complete sympathy for that point of view. Yeah. You know, I did not want to uh, meet Clinton. Right. You know, I went out of my way to not meet Clinton. Right. And talking to my buddy, Kinky Friedman, I probably would have loved, probably would love his company. Right, right. And he probably would have so much to tell me and teach me. No, get me wrong. I believe we started wars under false pretenses while he was president. Mm -hmm. But that's much different than starting war under false pretenses and not being president. (laughs) Yes. You know? Yeah. (laughs) Like, he was doing his job, which sucks. I think it's very hard. I think Carter's with the only modern president who didn't send us off to a war. Mm-hmm. So, you know. And there's an article in the Times that now there are people going to war that were born after the war started. Oh. It's the first time in American history that's ever happened. You know, which is why if you told me, you know, there'll be a president yeah. who will bring troops home, talk about space wars, and bang porn stars. It'd be very hard for me to conceive of not liking that. <laughs> How could you put, they would just say the words Donald Trump, and I go, oh yeah, I can see that, yeah. <laughs> but I didn't have that answer, because I didn't think he could be, you know. Uh, but if, yeah. is, if, there's, if there isn't more evidence that there is a God than what you just described, <laughs> there's a guy messing with you, yeah. specifically. Yeah, it's possible. You know, someone wrote in to say, do we, do we, do I entertain the fact that we could be living in a simulation? Ah. And that is a really good uh, argument for that. Let's fuck with Penn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's make, let's, let's make a guy he was on a reality show with president. Yeah. And have you seen the, 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 the Donald Trump flipping the finger? Yes. What, what was that? 
Uh, Had to be accidental, right? I think so. But he, the press is over there. Yeah. So I don't know. And you know, you wouldn't even say, oh, really? There's been a lot of women in space. He wouldn't even like back down that much. <laughs> Have you engaged in simulation uh, debate or thought? No, someone just wrote in. Okay. And as uh, Reddy Rich said, it's the same question as free will. Okay. I guess we don't. We don't have free will. You've made your point. Now, where do you want to go for dinner? <laughs> you know, we're living in a simulation. Yep, we absolutely are. Want to listen to Pink Floyd? I mean, <laughs> right. There's just no, it doesn't, it, it doesn't there's help no way it can way. change anything. Right. No way it can change anything. Yeah. Because then the idea of a simulation was given to you in the simulation. So- <laughs> okay. Well, Your Honor, you can lock me up as all you want. We're living in a simulation. I'm not actually going. Okay, to and this simulation is sending you to the fucking hole. <laughs> uh, okay. Right. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I don't know. Yeah. It is interesting though, and it'd be great. Somebody wicked smart who would break that. I don't know what information that would bring us. Yeah. You know, we're oh, in yeah, a, yeah. we're in a simulation. Oh, really? Now what do we do? I don't know. I guess uh, want to have dinner. <laughs> yeah, where? What's on? Oh, wait. What? But I. What am I definitely gonna say? Because <laughs> there's no free will, so I'm definitely gonna say the same restaurant. Yeah, I, I know it's not gonna be chicken. Maybe it will be. <laughs> I don't know. Crazy. So uh, how's uh, Memphis? Memphis. Uh, I found out something. Uh, well, this is not really true. I'm about to lie. Okay. And I'm gonna take a lie. When you have a lie that you tell yourself, and then you tell other people. Yes. Uh, it doesn't hold up. Right. But I believe that to be a vegan in Memphis is to eat steak fries, coleslaw, and pecan pie. <laughs> now, I know pecan pie is not vegan. Right. Right. I know coleslaw is not vegan. Nope. But I felt they were close enough, and I felt they were close. I said to the person at the barbecue joint, which is a great place. This is a great place called, I don't know, it's on the corner of Beale Street, and right near the uh, Peabody. By the way, let's discuss... I wasn't going to get into this, but I'm going to. Oh, gosh. Let's discuss the best job in the world. Do you know the Peabody Hotel in Memphis? Uh, yes. Okay, you do know of it. So you know what the Peabody Hotel has. Yes. It has ducks. Ducks, yeah, yeah. Now, I met six years ago, I met the duck master. Now, for those who don't <laughs> know the Peabody Hotel in Memphis, do you know about it? No. Okay. They have ducks. Um, and they have a beautiful duck house. But I know what my new video game name is. She's a duck. Mm -mm -mm. Master. <laughs> yeah. They have a nice duck house on the top of the hotel. Okay. Very nice place for, I always remember it as like a couple dozen ducks, but it's not. It's four ducks. Four ducks. Four ducks. Three walking geese, full Macedonian dress. One of us should have had that memorized, but we don't. <laughs> four ducks, three walking geese. What is that? You know that Five one. golden rings? No, no, it's not. You know, you know what I mean. <laughs> the broadcaster test. Oh, yes, I do. The uh, Macedonians in full. Eddie Gordetsky could do the whole thing. Yeah. And also, um, um, uh, uh, Florence and Lisa, Felicia and Eddie can do it. Um, uh, Howard Kalin can do the squawking geese. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, have you seen the uh, PBS one? No. With all the classical music stuff in it? No, I haven't. Is no, it it's, it's worse. It's worse. Yeah. Uh, but you can say the whole thing without an error, and that makes you yeah, a broadcaster? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I can't even say, as you can see, three, three of them. <laughs> but there is a place for the four ducks. And then at precisely 11 o'clock, the ducks march from their um, duck house to the elevator on the roof. They get in the elevator, the elevator takes them down, and then they march across the uh, lobby to the fountain where they are from 11 to 5. Then they march up, back up. And the duck master has a full red suit with, um, with braids, a military, military red suit um, with braids on it and a whistle around his neck and a cane with a gold duck head. And a badge that says Duck Master. <laughs> now, six years ago, I met the Duck Master and got a tour. And the Duck Master was this extraordinarily happy older gentleman. This time, I did not go to meet the Duck Master because we had a lot of work to do. Right. 
I did not see the ducks come down. It's also when the ducks come down, it's a beautiful thing because they have uh, uh, stanchions set up from the elevator to the pond. And then people are gathered like a parade on the side. <laughs> and the ducks, you know, are, um, are, are imprinted. And they know very well where they're going to go. And they've imprinted to the duck master, right? So they just waddle there. And there's, on the fountain, has steps that go, they come down. And the ducks waddle up the steps, get to the pond, and then duck all day. You know, they just do their duck thing. Now, a friend of duck mine. all day. A friend of mine who's an ornithologist, I sent the ornithologist a picture of the ducks and pointed out that there was one male duck and three female ducks. Uh -huh. So the duck master has a good job and the lead duck has a good job too. <laughs> and they just paddle around and quack. And there it's a Peabody uh, Hotel is touted is the best hotel in the South. And I haven't seen anything to contradict that. Uh, are you we, allowed to feed these ducks? No, I don't think so. I mean, there are, there were, I never saw any duck feeding. There were no sign that prohibited it. Okay. But it's also, the nice thing is it's in a really classy, um, lobby where they're serving like tea and it's a really nice place. There's a live piano player. And then in the middle, this very small pond, not this false spot fountain, small fountain with four ducks. And then at five o'clock, he goes, whip, blows his whistle, and they, all, and they march upstairs to go to duck bed. <laughs> and so I had, had met the old duck master, the old duck master. You old duck master. You old duck Get master. over here. How you doing, you old duck master, you? And um, this time I was in the elevator, and there was a much younger, maybe 30-year-old uh, uh handsome uh, African-American gentleman in the full duck master suit with the duck master thing. And uh, he had his holding his cane. And uh, I said to him, uh, hi, how you doing? He said, hi. And I said, how's it going? He goes, ah, I can't complain. Now, you know, when some people say they can't complain, yeah. it's with like, ah, I can't complain. Yeah, like, ah, I'm no. not going to bother you with my complaints. Who the fuck would listen to me? Like, I'm I not. can't complain like it's company policy that I can't complain to you. Right. I want to. He- But I can't complain. He, he answered it like he had searched his brain for a complaint that he might have that day. Couldn't find one. Because <laughs> he was duck master. And, he, and the cane was beautiful and worn like he had held that duck head. How many duck masters have there been? In my room. Now, this is something. <laughs> uh, Teller and I were given the two big suites. And Teller was in the Danny Thomas suite. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, there was a plaque on my door that said whose suite it was, and I didn't read it. So Teller said I was in the Danny Thomas suite. Where were you? I said, I didn't know. Which is a, probably the perfect the other pet one. story, yeah. And it was huge suite. I didn't. I didn't need. I mean, I, I, I have been given suites where I didn't find the other room. I've said yeah. that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gone in all night, and they go, "How'd you like your living room?" And I go, "Living room." <laughs> uh, but this was an enormous suite. I had, a, I had a kitchen and a dining room and a living room for entertainment and a big reception place and a bedroom for me, who was going to do nothing but. On my computer, right? right. Read a little bit. Um, but uh, uh, there was a big plaque on the wall with a picture of the original Duckmaster and a long story, the history of the Duckmaster, which also I probably should have read, but I didn't. Um, I just loved everything about it. Yeah. Not enough to read it, you know, three paragraphs, but I loved it. <laughs> and uh, I liked, I liked the, you know, first of all, Looking at ducks is funny. Yeah. Ducks are funny things. And I came down to the elevator. This is also when I was with the duck master. I was coming down to get in the car to go to the airport right when the ducks were coming down. So as I came down the elevator, the doors opened. There were three dozen people along stanchions waiting for the elevator door to open. And there was the duck master with me. <laughs> but no ducks. Never people have been more disappointed to see Penn Jillette. Uh, oh, that's not true. Uh, the time people were most disappointed to see Pendulet, and there have been a lot of times, there's a lot of contenders for this, <laughs> but I was hosting the New Music Awards. 
in uh, New York. I've told this before. Yeah, I, I had questions about the duck thing. Okay, let's get back to that. Um, these people lined up behind the stanchions. Yeah. Are they part of the production or tourists? Tourists. It's, it's advertised all over Memphis that the ducks walk to the fountain at 11 and walk back to the elevators at 5. It is the first, if not second thing people bring up when you visit Memphis. Yeah. So there's no, like, repertory theater or... You're you thinking know, they're like, plants? Like a comedy club or, you know, something else to do in Memphis? Oh. Well, wouldn't you go? I don't think so. You wouldn't go see the ducks walk? I mean, if I were in the hotel, yeah. yeah. Is, uh, it the, can... is it the only hotel in Memphis? No, hmm. no, no. No, there's a lot of hotels in okay. Memphis. There's a Best Western right across the street. Best Western, I think that has a, I think they have a mouse walk. <laughs> they have six alligators and no one gives a shit. <laughs> they come on, they do a, they do a, they do a full wrestling card and no one cares. No one watches. Um, when you go to your room, your soaps are duck shaped. They're little rubber ducks on your desk. Yeah. Uh, the towels are all wrapped, the, the washcloths are wrapped with little pictures of ducks. There's a duck theme. They figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> Every these, meeting is like, we should get new soaps made. Uh, ducks? Good idea, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly but surely. Because at one point, the, I think the hotel must have existed before the ducks, or was it part and parcel for the plan? I don't know. I don't know. I could have read that. Th I actually took a picture of it. <laughs> so I could, I, if we had breaks on here, I'd be able to look it up. Do you want me to read the ad and then you can catch up? Find out. Uh, <laughs> I have, I have the whole, uh, the whole duck thing, uh, right, right here. Well, Matt and I could do the, the experiment of how long we could argue, which is better Memphis or Kansas city barbecue. Edward D. Pembroke was the creator of the now world famous March of the Peabody Ducks and was the first ever Peabody Duck Master. He choreographed and trained North American mallard ducks to march on a red carpet into the magnificent uh, Tavertine marble fountain in the lobby of the Peabody Memphis, the South Grand Hotel, to the music of John Philip Sousa, King Cotton March. The title bestowed upon Pembroke was Peabody Duck Master. And with the Peabody Ducks, he marched into the history of Memphis, into the annals of American hotel industry. Nine-year-old Edward D. Pembroke, a native of Reading, Pennsylvania, carried out every child's dream. He ran away with the circus. It goes on and on. He loved to tell people about his time with the circus. He worked for $4.28 a week, delivering the mail. The After 13 years with the circus and some more years driving the bus for Count Basie's band, Pembroke arrived in Memphis in the late 1930s, where he quickly made friends with the founder of the blues, W.C. Handy, and other Beale Street performers. Finally, in 1940, Pembroke crossed the threshold of the Peabody Memphis, thus began a 50-year love affair with the Peabody Memphis and the Peabody Ducks. The ducks were already here when I arrived at the Peabody, he explained, <laughs> but they didn't have the march. That started with me. Pembroke, drawing on all he had learned in the circus, saw an opportunity to create something absolutely unique in the hotel industry. He trained the ducks to march to John Philip Sousa's King Cotton March. He created a scenario in which he would lead the ducks from their royal duck palace every morning at 11 a.m., ride down the elevator to the lobby fountain. He even laid out a red carpet to protect the ducks' web feet. Promptly at 5 p.m., the march would be reversed. That's not really true. They walk in the other direction. Back to the <laughs> Royal Duck Palace. He also designed a Peabody Duck Master uniform. The Peabody Ducks and Pembroke quickly became legendary celebrities and appeared on many national, international TV shows, including The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and Penn's Sunday School, and attracted media <laughs> attention in Memphis from all over the world. He answered most of the tourist questions. What are those going to be? <laughs> Uh, is there right, one for those you, for those is there you, unified field theory? For those of you listening at home, this is a test. What were the, what were the, Penn named the ducks he trained? Can you name the ducks he trained? Was Pembroke related to Yosemite Sam? And, oh, because he, he sounded kind of like him. <laughs> uh, Mr. Pembroke, didn't you ever want to change jobs to being here for five decades? His reply. The ducks are important to the Peabody, and I'm proud to be the one to see after them. I never saw any reason to change jobs. Looking into those twinkling eyes, one clearly saw the magical Pembroke pride and joy and realized how fortunate the Peabody Memphis was to have such a treasure. 
Plus, over the decades. Driving for Count Basie was a shit job. Yeah, it really was. Peabody Duckmaster have come and gone, but the name Edward D. Pembroke will be remembered and revered forever. Not true. Today, a picture of <laughs> Duckmaster Pembroke has his pride place in the lobby. Would you like to see a picture of Duckmaster Pembroke? Oh, that is wonderful. Yeah, with his ducks. Okay. So this kind of leans towards this one hypothesis, which is it wasn't always the duck hotel. It exist, the Peabody existed before the ducks. No, no. The ducks were always there. He added the duck march. I just covered this material. No, no. Oh, I'm why why'd you do sucky on your SATs? North American mallard was the answer. Yeah. Um, okay, good. <laughs> uh, it was like In other words, it wasn't always duck soaps and duck things. They just happen to have ducks in their fountain. They, they consider them pests. <laughs> right. So at some point, then he did this thing, and then, then everything became duck-oriented. I'm not a, a, aware of the uh, Cotton March by John Philip Sousa. Are you? Can you sing that? I don't remember it. Yeah. I mean, John Philip Sousa's Stars and Stripes Forever, a couple others, but I don't know that one. Which means there's I a chance. I bet if we pulled it up, we would know it. I bet we would. Too. There's a chance you're going to meet someone named Peabody, and you're going to go, oh, ducks, and he's going to roll his eyes. <laughs> Because he's like, no, the, the hotel is before the Ducks. Yeah. And it was a nice hotel before the Ducks. It's the Peabody Hotel. It's beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. My family built it. Yeah. Ducks were not the there weren't ducks. There weren't duck wallpaper when you went in the first time. No, no. It was, and it was a fine hotel. <laughs> we had three presidents stay there before yeah, the Ducks. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I'll also tell you my problem in, uh, in uh, Memphis. No, uh, no Vistro. Vistro is a nationwide 100% plant-based meal delivery service. In fact, Vistro is the number one plant-based meal delivery service in America. Oh. No prep work, chopping, or cleaning involved. All Vistro meals can be heated and served. So you can enjoy a hot, healthy, and delicious meal whenever you're hungry. Vistro meals have no added preservatives, using organic ingredients and f fresh frozen for maximum taste and nutrition. They'll keep in the freeze up to 10 weeks. We all know that a plant-based diet is better for your health and the environment, but changing the way we eat can be intimidating. Many people don't know where to start. It's so easy. It's great. I have, I have not tried it yet. My whole family has. Okay. My whole family has, and they love it. My children who don't usually like vegan food love these Vistro meals. And there's nothing to do. You just throw them in the microwave. The problem is I've been on the road, running around at the theater, rehearsing heavily. So I haven't really tried them, but country fried fake chicken, um, Tuscan uh, Cal calzones, yeah, uh, enchilada casserole, red curry, lots, lots more. I want to try the spaghetti bolognese. Oh yeah, because I like I like bolognese, and you know, getting that vegan because bolognese means meat is a little bit difficult. Uh, whether you're already vegan or just looking to add, you know, vegan curious is what we call it in the Craigslist ads. <laughs> Whether you're already vegan or just looking for to add more plant-based meal to your diet, a Vistro is a convenient, delicious solution, especially if you're busy and don't always have the time, energy, or inspiration to cook. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, Vistro has you covered with over 50 meal options. You can customize your meal plan around your tastes, including meal plans for weight loss. What a good deal. This is a great thing. Vistro offers free shipping on all orders. Right now, you can try the six most popular Vistro meals for just 49 bucks. 49 bucks. bucks. That's cheap. Try, visit TryVistro, T-R-Y-V-E-E-S-T-R-O.com slash pen. That's T-R-Y-V-E-E-S-T-R-O.com slash P-E-N-N. No commitment. Pause or cancel any time, but you can you can get all that forty nine dollar deal at trybistro.com slash pen. Ed. Yeah. It's a good thing. It's a really good thing. And there, I, I keep looking at my refrigerator, but my uh, my wife loves to cook. Right. So I get the meals there and then I go on the road. But I will soon she will be going away for a while and then it'll be uh, She's going to prison? Yep. Yeah, and then I'll be all that. But when I was in Memphis, I went to this wonderful restaurant. Is this it? That's what Ducks would it's march. It's a fine duck march song. Yeah, fine duck march. Guy did a good job. Yeah. Original Duck Master was a good job. But I'll tell you, the original Duck Master would have been very happy to see the Duck Master I saw in the elevator. Yeah. It took him that long to just find like a you know like a, a gimmick that he really could just lock into. Yeah, after driving the bus, working the circus. Yeah. Then he's travel, 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 trains and buses. Finally he's like, Oh, I mean, wake up, go over there, blow a whistle, play a song, wait five hours. <laughs> 
<laughs> I like that. I got that down. I like that. He tried a few others that were, weren't good. He tried to have an earthworm hotel. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, have a pile, we'll have a pile of dirt in the middle of the lobby and the earthworms will be in it. Turns out kindness or brutality, pigeons don't march for shit. Can't get them to do. <laughs> no. uh, you can change all the songs. It doesn't matter. They just don't. It's do like it. zebras, you know? We could not domesticate zebras. Yeah. Zebras are free spirits or assholes, depending on whether you're trying to train them or not. <laughs> if you're looking at them on the, uh, on yeah. the savannah, yeah. they're free spirits. If you're trying to get them to do something, they're assholes. Yeah. Zebras are assholes. <laughs> um, so I went to the Memphis restaurant uh -huh. and I had a woman, uh, the server mm -hmm. was very, very excited that we were there. Okay. First of all, it was uh, long suffering Glenn, mm -hmm. uh, Zeke, Teller, and me. We went to this blues barbecue rib joint mm -hmm. after our show to show you. Now, we were sold out, you know, sold out months in advance. Yeah. But people at the restaurant, which you could actually see the marquee for the Orpheum Theater there, <laughs> said, What are you guys doing in town? I want to really see your show live. I said, We were just at the Orpheum. They said, I didn't know that. I said, you work here? She said, all the time. I said, can, can you see the window? Can, <laughs> can you see the uh, the marquee says Penn and Teller tonight? She said, oh, I wish I'd known that. <laughs> also, this is something I want to ask about. Flirtatious is not the right word. Mm -hmm. This is just for um, uh, bragging. Okay. Okay. So we had a server. She was wonderful. And she came up, she looked at me and then put her hands over her mouth and went, oh, 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 I can't believe it. And then she explained that her father and she watch uh, Fool Us all the time. She was a big, big fan. And uh, she was very excited that we were there. And then she said something I've never heard someone saying. She said, I, I, I'm so thrilled to meet you. I just can't stop sweating. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I've heard people say shaking. Yeah. I've heard people say smiling. Right. I hadn't heard someone say sweating. Sweating. And then the woman, at the, the first greeter when you come in at the desk. Yeah. Who seats you. I guess host, right? Yeah. Um, she came up to me and said, I'm taller than you. Whoa. And I said, no, you're not. Demonstratively, you're not. <laughs> she said, I'm 6'1". I said, right, I got a half a foot on you. She said, I'm pretty much taller than you. I said, no, you're shorter than me. I said, look at now your eyes. They're looking up a little bit. She said, just a little bit. I said, yes, just a little bit. I'm taller than you. I said, I could eat off your head. Then someone else came over and said, we call her the Amazon. She's really tall. I said, yes, not taller than me. She said, I'm pretty tall. And that's kind of offensive. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I kind of didn't know about that. Yeah, yeah. And rethink that nickname. Yeah. Well, she seemed to embrace it. Oh, good. She said, my father's six foot eight. I said, he is taller than me. <laughs> but then I said... Uh, Hey, I'm taller than other people who look at you. <laughs> then we talked. Uh, I said, do you have vegetables? She said, yes, we do. She said, we have turnip greens and we have collard greens. I said, wonderful. Oh, is there anything else in them? She said, bacon and pork. <laughs> I said, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So I ended up with, uh, with steak fries and coleslaw, which, you know, Dr. Clapper would be uh, having conniptions. Sure. He would not. He would not approve, but man, they were good. Yeah, yeah. And then I had pecan pie, which I believe is made of what? Pork? No, but there's eggs in it, right? And butter, right? Eggs and butter. Butter, but I don't think eggs. Okay. And it was- The crust is- Yeah. Might be eggs involved in the crust. Who knows? Yeah. But it was really good. I had no ice cream on it, but it wasn't really healthful. No. It was, it was kind of, you know, politically- You didn't like go out for a quick 10 mile run after that, right? No, <laughs> I, um, I, I, I walked about the speed that the ducks walk, <laughs> but without Sousa, without Sousa, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, evil, uh, a friend of mine, uh, in England was on a panel mm -hmm. and the panel was about, um, whether we trust the art or the artist. Ah, it was about, do we punish 
artists by not looking at their art. Yeah. We've done something we don't approve of. And she's, she was going to be on the panel, but asked me to, you know, kind of bounce some ideas off her. Yeah. And, um, the questions we were being brought up were, uh, Michael Jackson, um, um, uh, Polanski, Roman Polanski, um, Woody Allen, uh, you know, all, all of that kind of stuff. And, uh, here's what I don't understand. Um, what do we think a boycott accomplishes of Michael Jackson. If we don't listen to Michael Jackson, now, does that mean that there's someone that we postulate that goes, I'd really like to abuse these children, but I'm not going to because after I'm dead, people might not listen to my hit singles? <laughs> right. So. Is there, there's no deterrence to this, right? What, what's the thinking behind this, Randy? Well, there's deterrence if the person's still alive, right? Michael Jackson, I, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you oh this, but he gosh. passed away. What? <laughs> also, um, I brought up, and I think this is, she probably will not bring this up because this would get her in trouble, but I'll bring it up. I listen to Bach. Right. And uh, I enjoy Bach. I'm not a huge Bach freak, but I enjoy Bach. And he did St. Matthew's Passion and Jack Kerouac, supposedly on a Benzedrine rant, wrote On the Road while listening to St. Matthew's Passion over and over again. Right. I believe Christianity has done a lot of damage to the world. Right. And I speak out against Christianity, not Christians, Christianity. I speak about the sin, not the sinner. Um, now, when we talk about Bach being a genius and plays music all the time, are, are we condoning everything that's been done bad in the name of Christianity? Right. I, I don't know. And uh, do, I mean, I don't understand if there's, is there any deterrent at all? I'm. It's difficult, like, you know, because you bring this up, you know, time matters in these equations as well. Mm -hmm. Like, in other words, uh, we'll be more specific with time. So in the history of music, Michael Jackson's imprint on it is undeniable. Mm -hmm. his, his, his music that has followed him, he's had an unbelievable impact on how pop music sounds to this mm -hmm. day. Well, Quincy Jones, but yes. Michael right. Jackson. But, but, but he'll get credit, don't yeah, you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. And so in time, that credit will only become more specific and cemented, mm -hmm. you know, and we won't go back because we won't be talking about Michael Jackson outside of music Ever really, you know, in any historical context. So it's, I don't know though. What about I mean, Fatty Arbuckle? Yeah, Fatty Arbuckle, the highest paid uh, movie performer in history. Yeah, including Tom Cruise, including everybody. Fatty Arbuckle, highest paid, considered to be one of the funniest people ever have lived, and really completely forgotten because of being um, uh, almost certainly. Uh, uh, falsely accused of raping a woman with a Coca-Cola bottle. Right. And I mean, you don't even know he raped a woman with a Coca-Cola bottle yeah. because he's been completely erased. Right. Totally erased. You know, there's um, there's the, uh, they used uh, Gary Glitter's Rock and Roll Part 1 in a recent movie. Right. And so his estate, Part 2, got, uh, his estate got, you know, da 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 da. Hey, but da 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 da. So he gets money for that, and he is a convicted, correct, child molester. Yeah, you know what's funny is I was uh, looking for that song, forgetting that it was Gary Glitter. I was going to use it as a sting in my act, and then when I went to research to get the MP3, I was like, oh, and I did actually not put it in my show because of it. Well, that's it. We were doing a we were doing a, a bit in the uh, Magic Goes Wrong show. Yeah, uh, where um, where uh, Henry Henry uh, Shields yeah. produces Dead Doves, and uh, because my children sing it, I suggested I believe I can fly, and we had I believe I can fly it was all choreographed to, and then um, I saw the videos, everything it was all good, really really funny. Yeah, and then I went 
flew over to Manchester to see the rehearsals and it was close to you. Why do birds <laughs> suddenly appear? And I went, oh, you, you changed the music. And uh, Shields went, yeah, we didn't want R. Kelly in the show. And I went, oh, oh yeah, of course. Right. Of course. Really, of course. And by the way, uh, Close to You was better than right. I Believe I Can Fly. It worked out, the choreography and so on. And so like in a way that you're already kind of starting to break this up into both taste and stories we choose to tell. So what you're basically saying is by um, – having people constantly remember what Michael Jackson might have done personally, the story end is, might end up being told to Quincy Jones. You know, it might end up being yeah. the sound. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's debatable because all those people from the silent era of movies, yeah. the comedians we remember from that time, uh, Buster Keaton and so on, were contemporaries of Fatty Arbuckle. And yeah. Fatty Arbuckle is forgotten. And uh, I think one one person stood behind him, and that was uh, that was Buster Keaton, right? Who actually, and uh, I, I guess uh, he's the first victim, considered the first victim of tabloid journalism, where they just made up the rumors and went with them. And I think it's almost certain that he was innocent. Wow, and I mean like completely innocent, right? Um, like it wasn't like a he said she said thing, right? Uh, I don't even think she said. It was just a rumor going around. I think it was, he said, press says. Yeah. And he was completely ostracized and erased. Erased. So I don't know. I don't know. You know, and that, but what I don't know is what we are trying to accomplish with these boycotts. And then we got the other stuff, the very confusing ones, like Woody Allen, where Woody Allen was accused by his daughter. And uh, his son, Ronan, um, really believes that his father's guilty. But his father has been checked by two courts with extensive experience in this, looking into it in a very elaborate, unpleasant trial and was cleared in both cases. Right. You know, I have a friend who is innocent of a crime. Uh, I, I feel very strongly he's innocent of the crime. And he is about to go to court. I'm not even going to say the city okay. or anything. Uh, he's about to go to court. And uh, very likely, very likely will be found not guilty because the person has recanted testimony and they have also done this before and they're crazy and blah, blah, blah. He'll, almost certainly. And there is already a extensive organization that says if he is found not guilty, they will continue to punish him. He will not be able to work. They will boycott his work. They will do all this because uh, the court system is not fair. Now, for a free speech, not like me, that should be allowed. Right. But man, it seems like if Woody Allen goes through, you know, this is where Scarlett Johansson is. She may be the bravest person we have. Right. Because Scarlett Johansson uh, said she'd work with Woody Allen. Yeah. When the whole bandwagon. She also said that she should be able to play any part she wants in acting. Yeah. Now, I only knew Scarlett Johansson as <laughs> people just listening. I can I can hear all your eyes rolling. Okay. The only place I ever heard of Scarlett Johansson was in the Bob Dylan video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you took your kids to see the Avengers. You know I she's in those movies. Yeah, I didn't notice really. In the, in the Bob Dylan, I went, whoa, why does Bob have her in there? Yeah. Um, but uh, I am starting to pay attention a lot to Scarlett Johansson. Yeah. I mean, my question would be, why isn't she president? Right. Scarlett Johansson seems to be willing to speak truth to real power. Yeah. Not truth to fake power. Yeah. But to real power. Uh, I mean, she knows Woody Allen. I don't. I've met him, shook his hand. Yeah. I don't have any inside information. I have a lot of mutual friends of his that absolutely love him and- trust him completely and don't believe any of these allegations. But that's not information. That's not special information. No, no. But I just don't know. And I also got to tell you, and this is the tough one, murder, you know, has this lowest recidivism rate, very low recidivism rate. Right. Now, the police officer who went into the person's apartment and shot the gentleman on his couch. Yep. Okay. We're not talking about the other police officer who shot through the window at the uh, woman playing with her video games with her nephew. 
I'm talking about the the one where the uh, uh, the brother of the uh, of the victim went across the courtroom and hugged her. Yeah, one of the most amazing pieces of video we'll ever see, and also a big big argument for Christianity. Mm-hmm. I mean, he did that all in the name of Christianity, and uh, boy, it was a, it was a beautiful thing to see. But you look at that and you go, she's going to do time in prison. Um, it's not like someone else is watching this and going, well, she's doing time in prison, so I guess I'm never going to go to the wrong floor while texting, walk into an apartment and shoot a guy. No one's considering doing what she did. Right. I mean, this is the thing that drives me crazy with true deep tragedy. You know, the guy who leaves his children in the car because he's exhausted and overworked and leaves them parked in the sun when he goes to work, strapped in car seats. Yeah. And they die. And the pain that person experiences. I mean, then there's also other cases where they probably did it on purpose. Right. Uh, or they're, or, you know, they're, uh, it's, it's, it's worse ways that they're, uh, exhausted. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. drug addict and yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever that kind of thing. Yeah. But here's the thing. And you know, they're talking about Picasso, the way he treated women was, was bad. So mm-hmm. maybe we shouldn't have his art, boycott his art in places. Um, that's where, so criminal stuff versus just like not great guy stuff. Like if you told me that stand up comedians weren't the most functionally sociable people, I'm not going to be too surprised. If you told me like this, these crazy eccentric, bizarre artists had a tough time getting along in typical social environments, I'm not going to be surprised, you know? So, uh, when we get in the category of like, who's a fucking asshole that is also a genius. But then you got Wagner. Yeah. You know, Wagner Nazi. Yeah. And Wagner's work has that, you know, uh, Nazi feel to it yeah. in some way. There's this, you know, triumph of the will, those, those words, uh, kind of bring to mind the tectonic. I think it's so much more fragile and fluid than we think. All of our records, all of our history is actually kept by people. And the longer you go back, it's by very specific people, you know, Mm -hmm. that do articles on things or find a, even find outlets for these articles. You know, it's very, we have so much of human history. That's crazy stories that have taken wild turns that we just lose track of over time. But here's what, and I bring this up over and over again, and uh, you said some of the Joe Rogan people who've joined us, um, wondering about uh, the existence of evil. I just don't see any evidence for evil whatsoever. I see people making bad decisions and doing bad, bad things. You know, I also think that with all this talk about um, um, guns, yeah. Uh, are any of these things done sober? What is the gun violence done by sober people? What is that percentage? Do we have that number? Do we have the number of the people that have shot somebody and killed somebody is that this- then go in and they are 100% sober? No drugs, no alcohol? I'm clueless on this. Yeah, I don't know. But you know, when I went to the trauma unit here in Vegas where they save Roy's life, yeah, considered the best trauma unit on earth. And I said to the guy, what are my chances of showing up here? Oh, I said, how much of your, how many of your problems here are alcohol related, drug related, alcohol related? He said, 100%. 100%. Now, I was leading him. I was trying to get him to say something like that. Yeah. I said, it can't be 100%. He said, okay, we're rounding off to 100%. He said, we don't get anybody in here uh, sober. Anybody. I said, what about people in traffic accidents? He goes, okay, the other guy was too drunk. He said, but every barbecue accident, every guy diving into a uh, reservoir and breaking his neck, uh, every burn, children, every fire, everything, every shooting, every knifing, uh, every car accident, every pedestrian hit, uh, all related. All related to drugs and alcohol. What about, uh, would you say to someone who maybe plotted for months to kind of gather 
the 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 more the I don't know. This is the question that drives me crazy. And when I say this to uh, you know Robbie, my buddy Robbie, yeah, he just rolls his eyes like I'm an asshole. But I am. But why do we incarcerate people? Okay, so they won't do it again. You got a guy that's stealing shit all the time. Stop him from stealing shit. How do you stop from stealing shit? Well, lock him up where he steals shit from other people who steal shit, right? Right. But get him away from us, right? I understand the idea of removing people from society yeah. who are not, who are causing a lot of people suffering. And then there's the deterrent. If I do this, I will be punished, so I won't do it. Now, how many things, Ready Rich, do you uh, not do because of fear of government punishment? I mean, you would probably not pay your taxes the way you pay them without government punishment, right? I almost, I think I'm so libertarian that I'd be more likely to pay taxes if I didn't have to. Mm -hmm. What about you? Uh, I mean, is, has, has the fact that violence is illegal ever stopped you from committing violence? Tough call, honestly, only yeah. because I was instilled in me at a young age. You know, my father was a defense attorney mm -hmm. and uh, I was around for like a chat. Basically, you know, my, my older brother kept the football team and that kind of stuff. And he, he enjoyed a nice physical outlet and, and, and certainly had, had some fist fights in his day. Uh, and uh, my father, I remember at a young age, just said, you know, it's seven years for assault in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, punching somebody out. They just decide instead of fighting back to just call the cops seven years, you know? So I remember him telling me that as a kid. Mm -hmm. So I don't know is the answer there. Certainly the way I drive, mm -hmm. I don't want to get pulled over. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. I think about taxes, but I also do believe in funding a government that, the the you know. I said that wrong. I want to fix it. Mm -hmm. I would be more likely to treat government as charity. Like I do charity. Mm-hmm. But if I comes, were, if I didn't have to do it at gunpoint, I would send more money. You could send more money, and people don't. Yeah, but you would never. Um, you don't believe if uh, you had no fear of punishment, there's anybody you'd be beating up. Is that right, Ready? In this, it doesn't change my morality at all. Yeah, I, I don't know. So here's the thing: we've got this police officer woman who was, well, I guess, sexting and probably drunk a little bit or high, maybe. I don't know. I didn't read the case that life and went to the wrong floor of her apartment building. And she walked in, thought there was an intruder in there and she shot him. There's certainly a racial element to that. No doubt about it. Right. Um, she shot him. Yeah. She shot him dead. She is, um, as guilty as a human being could possibly be. Yeah. She does not deny that she pulled the trigger. Um, is there any deterrent involved in locking her up? I don't think so. Is there so, anybody else that's going to say, I'll be more careful what floor I get, get when I have a gun? I mean, it seems like maybe talking about police officers not having guns off duty or something like that. Right. Maybe that's something to think about, but is there any deterrent? And also, is there any chance of her doing something like this again? Zero, right? I believe so, yes. Yeah. So um, what does that punishment mean? Right. What does her going to prison mean? And I say that to Robbie, and he says that's justice. There has to be repercussions for one's actions. There must be. And, you know, there are, you know, philosophers that argue that you want to be punished for something like that. Sure. Sure. That, that, that that's the only thing you could, that's the only solace she's going to ever have. Yeah. I think I've, we've, we exactly. Yeah. We, we want to be punished. Uh, is, is there something to be said? I'm totally, you know, picking this out of the air, but like, you know, being a citizen, a functioning citizen is a privilege or something, right? Right. But the privilege, I just have such trouble with this. You know, there's obviously, I don't, I don't remember any of this, but I read an article, um, some Scandinavian country. Yeah. who's really doing country club prisons. I mean, really nice and comfortable and really, really low sentences. And they are not getting, uh, getting lower recidivism than we are on everything. 
Right. I mean, we're not sending her to prison to rehabilitate her. No. She's not going to take classes saying, here's how you use an elevator to get off on the right floor. Right. You know, don't be sexting when you've got a gun. I've added that sexting in. I read it in one article that that's the way I picture it. You know, that she's looking down at her phone and yeah. all of a sudden, Jesus Christ, I'm in my apartment, you know. Yeah. But I don't know if that's true. But my problem is, I think I don't believe in punishment and I don't believe in evil. When I talk to my children, I use taking away their electronics to do their homework and so on, in order to do behavior modification, which is different than punishment, very different than punishment, you know? And if you take away behavior modification and you take away recidivism, is there something you have left? Uh, now, I don't want to do any sort of horrific hypothetical because that's disrespectful to people who've really suffered. But let's take something much. Okay, Dan Sperry. Yeah. Okay, Dan Sperry had his uh, place broken into. And do we know any more about this? Nope. Okay. Some criminals took a bunch of his stuff. And he had to do a fundraising campaign. He was really terribly inconvenienced. Now, I'm not talking about hypothetically someone else. I'm talking about us. So now they tell us that that person that stole that stuff from... Dan Sperry, um, is, uh, is, uh, been caught. And let's also say that we are, we have no doubt about that person's guilt. Okay. Mm. Now, and let's say we are sure the guy won't do it again. This is a hypothetical here. Okay. We're sure he won't do it again. And, um, he's just not going to do it again, whether you put him in prison or not. Do you want him to be punished? Yeah. You do. I mean, it's a tough call because, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, are there other would be burglars who, when they see how we don't punish, but that's the deterrent element, right? Take that away. Okay. Take that away. There's no deterrent. And he's not going to do it again. Like, so like on a personal level, if I could see someone who robbed me and hear their story and forgive them, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And could I advocate that they don't go to jail? That's why I picked. Uh, that's why I picked Dan Sperry. Yeah, instead of you. Right. So, do I want the guy who robbed Dan Sperry to go to jail right now? You know, they're starting to do this thing, uh, which I don't understand. I read one rather long article on it, and I even forgot the name of it. Where the victim and the perp uh, talk, they yeah. talk about it and make some arrangement. Now, obviously, if that guy could give Dan Sperry back his money and more, you know, if they can make an arrangement where over the next, you know, five years, he's going to give Dan Sperry 50 grand. Right. Make up for what he lost and also his problems. Yeah. Uh, would, would we like that better than the guy going to prison? I think so. I just don't know. And there's some people to whom justice, like I, I had this argument with Lou Reed an awful lot, an awful lot. You know, because he's got a, he's got a, uh, on his, uh, a songs for Drella record with John Cale. There's a song about, um, uh, what's, uh, Andrea Solanas, what's her name? Who shot Andy Warhol? I forgot her name. Yeah. It's good that I forgot her name. Right. Um, she, uh, she shot Andy Warhol and she got some time in prison. And, uh, uh, he sings in that song, I believe it's elemental. Uh, the justice is an absolute that I swear I'd pull the switch on her myself is what he says in that song. And when I talk to Lou as a, as a person, as a friend, uh, that was not a misrepresentation. That was not a character in the song. That was Lou's feeling. At least the, the day that I talked to him about this, I don't want to misrepresent somebody, especially when Lou has died now and can't, can't correct me. Um, but let's say, there are people who believe that justice is elemental and that an eye for an eye is absolutely mandatory. This is where it gets tougher, right? Because part of why we have laws and why we believe in government is so that we don't just arbitrarily always rule from emotion. Right. right? 
Isn't it like a higher calling? Well, that's what my, my that was the argument I made against capital punishment on bullshit. Right. My argument was people always say to me, if someone killed your whole family, wouldn't you want them dead? And I say, why you? T- why would you be talking to me? I- I'm the I'm I'm the one that can't make that decision. Right. I've just contradicted myself, by the way, because I've said, why don't the the victim and the perpetrator talk? And then I've said the victim does shouldn't have anything to say. <laughs> but as a um, as a society, what do we want out of punishment? And I want to well, go back to this. I don't do not believe. That there is an evil in the world that we're trying. I believe evil is exactly the same as God. But I am not saying when I say there's not evil that there are not people who do bad things. And that's the part that people get confused about. Yeah. We, if we start from the point of the the term evil is meant to describe a supernatural force. Yes. Then we understand. It makes it easier. What? Yeah. Even if we're talking about it in terms that aren't supernatural now, mm-hmm. we're just we're still pointing to that ultimately. Yeah. And I think I mean, when we recognize talk about evil. They are talking about, if not a supernatural force, at least a force inside of all of us. We recognize that there are sociopaths mm-hmm. that, you know, serial killers and things like that. Yeah. Neurotics have questions. Psychopaths have answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, couple, oh, sorry. You, you were you finishing a point? That's complete. The, Two things, like one, you're certainly poking something. We know, we are starting to understand we've gotten a little bit of our, our version of crime and punishment wrong. We're seeing, for the first time, I, as far as I know, like advocating for less harsh punishments when people are even running for elections and things like that, which yeah. is strange. Yeah. Well, it's also um, that less harsh punishments, I mean, we, the United States, one of the ways we have gone the most wrong is yeah. how many people we put in prison. Right. And then on top of that, what things we haven't even explored at all is you talk about recidivism, right? Mm-hmm. There are studies of just simply behaviors in recidivism, right? Like if they simply go back to their old neighborhoods and things like yeah, that. Yeah. So there's nothing in place for that. Like mm-hmm. there, there are things that we could do to deter recidivism outside of a jail, and we do nothing, right? On the on that yeah. end, and also you know, uh, it also drives me crazy that um, we have no. In terms of our social media, we have no stories of redemption. We have now decided that if someone posted racist stuff five years ago, they must atone for that now. Forever. And forever. Forever. Um, And, you know, uh, uh, the, the Kavanaugh hearing. And I, of course, I couldn't disagree with Kavanaugh more on everything. We just start with that. Yes. I disagree with him on everything. And uh, and there are certainly legit disqualifiers. To absolutely. His, to his Supreme Court. He should court. not have been yeah. on the Supreme Court. Right. Done. Great. But when you go back to what, what troubles me is when somebody commits a horrible drug murder when they're 17 or 18 years old, you know, they're in a gang. And they do a drive-by or a drug deal and they kill somebody. And they go to prison and they study law and they clean themselves up. And at 35 years old, they're released and they go back into society and they become a useful citizen. There's that guy in D.C., that wonderful lawyer who did time for murder mm-hmm. and is actually a uh, seller. He's got a whole, uh, yeah. a whole, there's a whole book written about him. We celebrate that. And yeah. I, I think justly. And there's a big problem. There's a, there's a company in Brooklyn that hires people without any check of their background. Yeah. There's no background checks to hire anybody. And they judge everybody from how they start that day. There's something really beautiful about that. And at the same time we're doing that and fighting for that role of redemption, there's the guy who wanted to do the beer money and then wanted to give it to children and they went back and he had said this awful stuff on his Twitter when he was 16 or 17. Right. And um, so people were turning against him in uh, in awful ways. And he said, I, I just don't believe that anymore. You know, even something is, um, you know, we're not talking about jail here, but something like Sarah Silverman having done a sketch in blackface. Um, uh, let's even uh, not even say that there was context that we're ignoring. Right. Let's just say that was wrong. Yeah. And let's even say that, I mean, we are different people than we were yesterday. Yeah. 
I mean, she lost her job because she's the one who called attention to it being wrong, even though she thought she was right at the time. Mm -hmm. She gave herself credit for context in the moment and removed that herself mm -hmm. later with her talk show and then got punished for uh, the only reason anyone knew about that and why she lost work was because she called attention to it, atoning for it. Yeah, she was, she, she was, she, yeah, she, there was no, there's no story of redemption. Yeah. And I, it's also like people don't even do it that way. They have to do this mea culpa of I was a horrible, terrible person. Yeah. Instead of being able to say, I'm a different person now. Full stop. Full stop. I'm a different person. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know how. Also, somebody like the uh, police officer who, uh, who, who shot the man in his apartment, um, her life is ruined. Yeah. I mean, that was goes to maybe she's she's better off in prison. Maybe she's better off having enough punishment that she can rail against that, you know? Yeah. And say, I don't deserve this much punishment. Maybe that's the only hope she Very has. likely she would seek some form of punishment one way or another. Oh, sure. With that. But I don't know. So for those who, uh, I do have uh, real problems with uh, with the idea of punishment. I have real problems with the idea of justice. I understand intellectually that um, that's how society works, but it seems way wicked, crazy, Judeo-Christian to me. It's like, uh, or you know, Abrahamic religions. Well, we know that punishment doesn't work, but behavior modification does, mm -hmm. and that's where we have to figure out exactly where the lines are to be drawn in, in the justice system. And where the government's role is in that. Yeah, you know. Uh, Lady Gaga, yeah, doing a concert here over the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, took a guy up out of the stands, yeah, yeah. danced with him, and, and he fell with her. Yeah, big fall. Yeah. Um, she got up and she said, first things first, I want you to know I'm okay. Second thing, I, I'm asking if you're okay." He says, "Yes." And she goes, "And now I want you to forgive yourself. I want you to forgive yourself right now. I want you to let go of everything that just happened and give yourself permission right now to have fun and enjoy the rest of the concert." Wow, I didn't know that part of it. Yeah. And I was like, that is fascinating to me that she's that wise. Yeah. And I was like, Lady Gaga, Scarlett Johansson, <laughs> these are our heroes now. Yeah. Why wouldn't they be? Yeah. Wow. So, and was it, I mean, I, I, now I'm, I want to go back on everything I've said. Was he in some way culpable? I mean, you, was there alcohol involved? Front row concert, Lady Gaga concert? Maybe. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, and he's getting carried away. But he, was, he, he certainly wasn't uh, trained to, to do that, you know. Uh, but, you know, uh, she was relying on him for support and he slipped and he fell. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I don't, I don't even know. You know, I don't even know. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you'd be responsible for it when you picked out the audience at your show, right? Shut up. <laughs> Shut, no, no, I'm not responsible for anybody. What are you talking about? This could be played anytime. That's crazy talk. Crank, <laughs> crank call, crank call, prank call, prank call, prank call. I, that was a crank. I don't even know what those words mean. What do those words mean? Those words mean nothing. That was Pet Sunday School. That was Pet Sunday School. Cha cha cha. And to our listening you become naked. You know, um, people asked about You Become Naked. It's a line from Revolution Number no. 9 by the Beatles. And what are you doing? What's that? What are you doing? I'm explaining it. This is a perfect let me Google that for you question. Okay. That's all I answer is let okay. me Google. <laughs> but to me, it also ties in with Allen Ginsberg saying the poet must stand naked on stage. So become naked because I love you.